Have you ever wondered how much Patrick and Paul missed in the first century? Have you ever asked yourself, why didn't they cover that? Well, so have we. And boy, do we have some stories for you. This is the AD History Podcast, weaving a tapestry of world history from 1 AD to HD. Powered by TGNR. Get your good news that's real news at TGNR by visiting tgnreview.com. Now, here are your hosts, Paul K. DiCostanzo and Patrick Foote. And brought to you via London and New York City, you are listening to the AD History Podcast. I am Paul K. DiCostanzo, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Patrick Foote. How was that, Paul? Did, did, did I nail it? That was the most atrocious thing I've seen in days. <laughs> Oh, I hope I don't but... sound like that in real life. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's just okay, an awful American accent. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, that's fine. Well, in any case, so what we missed, the first century AD, and the fact of the mm-hmm. matter is, given our format, you're going to miss a lot. And we can't even cover everything that we wanted to cover, even in an episode entirely dedicated to covering things that we wanted to cover. Mm-hmm. Yes, but we will do best our best to, to cover them if they can be covered at all. So for this uh, edition of what we missed, so just to explain what this sort of episode is, I think the intention is after every 10 episodes every uh, century, makes sense, we're just going to do a sort of a more silly, lighthearted episode like this, talking about just some of the things we didn't talk about on actual AD history, because even though we covered two subjects per episode, there's still so much we missed out on. And we have some really fun stories here, which... I can't believe, unfortunately, didn't get episodes onto themselves. But, Paul, are you ready to have a look back at some of of the things we missed, I guess? I I guess guess it is time to reflect. But before we go in that direction, Patrick, let's lay down our obligatory, necessary, now legendary AD History Podcast Ground Rules. 1. Evaluate events in the context they occurred. 2. Over the span of recorded history the way it was recorded, its methodology, and the facts that are important have changed immensely. How we view history today is not necessarily how we viewed it 50 years ago. Three, nothing in history was inevitable. And four, history and the past is like a different country. You have the floor. Cool. So this is about the Chlung sisters and their revolt in Vietnam. And this this lasted from 40 to 43 AD. And Paul, did you know anything about the Trunk Sisters at all? I can safely say I did not. No, neither did I. And they were, and I just want to say, sorry about pronunciation this one. They were two sisters by the names of Truck and Ni, and they were daughters of a powerful Vietnamese lord. But during this time, uh, Vietnam, modern Vietnam as we know it today, was still part of China's rule. And it just came to a breaking point when Truck, one of the sisters' husbands, was assassinated by the Chinese who were plotting to overthrow their regime. And with uh, the, her husband's death, Track and her sister Ni, they just started a rebellion. They gathered 80,000 people in support uh, in the intention of clearing out v- uh, the Chinese from Vietnam. And they liberated 65 cities in Vietnam that were under Chinese control. And not only this, they liberated so much of the land, they declared Vietnam as an independent state way before Vietnam became the independent state it is today. This was like basically 2,000 years ago we had an independent Vietnam. And as part of this independent state, they both took on the title of Xi King, because why be a queen when you can be a Xi King? And I just thought that was a great title to give themselves. Uh, I, I'm really curious to, to, to get the, if I could get the greater flavor of the original words and the original language they were using it in. But yeah, no, it definitely... Yeah. It's it, it's certainly unorthodox from our perspective, but mm. it makes its point well enough. Hundred percent. And to, as Xi kings of this independent Vietnam, they sort of eradicated a lot of the Chinese traditions that was installed on them, like tribute taxes and sort of complex forms of government. Government. And this rule uh, lasted for about three years, from forty A.D. to forty three A.D., when eventually the Chinese ousted them. And the legends goes that once they were um, being ousted, instead of being killed by the Chinese, they took their own lives. As we see so often, um, that was very much the same thing with Bodicea, as we actually did talk about in the show. And since then, they have become these sort of huge legendary figures in Vietnam. And many feel that the nation of Vietnam, as it is today, wouldn't exist without these two. And on top of this, what I like about this story is not only does it highlight something happening all the way over in Asia, 
it highlights some women in history and we just don't have many stories of women from this time period of history and i just found that fascinating well yeah absolutely especially when they upend the traditional power order and and then manage to to reign vietnam out of that what i'd imagine I'm curious what their position was regarding China under the Xin Dynasty, but effectively some form of dominion within the sphere of influence of Han China, which is kind of fascinating. Mm. I had not heard about this, but it is definitely no. extremely interesting to know. Where did you find this? I gave it a Google. I was sort of just having a look around through the adults of history, as we like to say. Yes. And I just came up with this. I was like... Ho like holy moly, how how did this not come up for our actual episode? Because I would love to have talked about this in more detail. And I'd love to know I, I mean I've never been to Vietnam myself, obviously, but I'd love to know if we have anyone listening from Vietnam what the what how how well known the sisters story is, if it is a huge folklore tale over there. Well, I can definitely tell you based on our analytics, it is faux show that we have <laughs> Vietnamese listeners. Well, what I can say is there's one thing I, I, I never get tired of is is Vietnamese Chamber of Commerce or quite literally playing on every single pun having to do with pho. <laughs> no, it's very good stuff. It, you it, got any it, examples? I just used one for... <laughs> yeah, know. of course. Yes, like I Blah. said, it's pho show. They are, they are <laughs> listening to us right They're now. Always, always listening. But that was just one of the things uh, in regards to what we missed that just really came up as interesting to myself. But Paul, is there anything you want to talk about more directly about things we missed from these first hundred years of AD? So I'm sure some of our more astute observers and listeners, of which we can count many just because we have mm. really an amazing audience, is you'll notice we kind of uh, sidestepped the Great Fire of Rome in 64 AD under our good friend Nero. And in general, Nero, like as I was talking to you, we didn't, we, we really skirted around Nero himself as well, which is quite r remarkable considering what an awful person he was. So obviously you have to make a lot of hard editorial choices and we've covered the Roman Empire quite a lot and for good reason because there's so much good stuff going there. But for some reason it didn't end up covering Nero. And, you know, this is the thing, of course, that Nero, for the most part, for most people, insofar as they know anything about Nero, is they his, his association with this great fire. And what is less known, though, about the great fire and just natural disasters relating to Rome itself, not the greater empire, not even Italy necessarily, is that Rome was extremely susceptible to these sort of things, just given how they're built. they very susceptible to flood very susceptible to fire. The, the whole flooding thing, in fact, I believe was only really settled, I believe, in the 19th century when they built, <laughs> I believe Barracks. it was a large levy. I think there was a okay, large yeah. levy that was built Barracks. there that, that re really helped with that. But mm. they were especially susceptible to fire, especially because they were literally, Rome was very densely populated. So you could have one house and one home, and then you have another one on top of it, obviously, a lot of low rise at that point. And just given the proximity, something like fire can set off just like that. Or literally the, the lower half of one building can be flooded and the one on top is fine insofar as any foundational mm. issues go. But as far as this is, this is a really serious one because, well, let's put it this way. It had a lot of significant consequences. And apparently it was started in the shops by the uh, Circus Maximus and mm. via wind and wooden houses, the, the fire spread quickly. And... When fire is spreading quickly, even though in Rome they did have they did have elements of things like firefighters and whatnot. It's not exactly what we would consider to be emergency services today <laughs> by any imagination whatsoever. But they existed. But even for us, I mean, we would like to think today that this sort of widespread fire, when you talk about big fires, you talk about Rome, you talk about Chicago and London. Uh, oh, yeah, of course, London. Yeah, mm -hmm. back, uh, I guess that was, what, about 300 years ago? A little more than that about now? Then, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the Great Fire of London. And, and so today, even with well-thought-out and hopefully well-enforced fire codes, something goes wrong, it can go wrong really fast. And in this case, there are a lot of consequences of this. I don't know if you, you should take this part from here. One of the best ways I can explain this, and 
spoilers for Game of Thrones if you want to stop listening. But Paul, you remember the last sort of season of Game of Thrones when Daenerys just turns on King's Landing? And in fact, I have not watched the final season of Game of Thrones because mm, I wanted bad. to wait for them to all come out. And it was so bad that I just kind of basically headcanon the rest of it. And then I'm gonna let, okay. and let and and let my wife know what what happens when he finally releases his final book. So d don't worry about spoiling it for me. I <laughs> I, I know pretty much in consensus the final okay. season was awful. Well, yeah. Well, things towards the end things get quite fiery in King's Landing. I'll say, and you just have all these people huddled around, like just trying to escape the fire. And that's what was happening in Rome. These sort of narrow, dense streets. And as you mentioned, Paul. Rome was a seriously densely packed city. Of course, it, it isn't got anything on like the modern metropol metropolises we have on today's planet, but it would have been densely packed. People wanted to live in Rome because that's, well, that was the centre of their worlds. So it did get packed. It just had these really scared people just, just crammed into these alleyways, just trying to be safe. And what was interesting is when people were trying to put the fire out, some other men were found throwing torches into the fire and when they were stopped saying, Oi, why are you throwing more fire into the fire? They responded by saying they were under orders. Whose orders exactly? Well, Paul, whose orders do you think they are under? Well, it is large. So there's a lot of debate. But mm. generally, the idea here is that they are getting directives on high from the one who begins, whose name begins with end and ends with Eero. <laughs> Yes, so uh, this is like, it's a Nero, we didn't really talk about much, and this is one of his most famous, infamous sort of eras being ruler during the Fire of London. Fire of London? Fire of Rome. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I see, Mix, mi there. mixing up our imperial capitals now, are we? Is this, <laughs> this what's happening here? Mixing up our blazed imperial capitals, but yeah. the fire lasted for around five days to begin with, and while it was thought to be put out, the thing with fire is if it's not completely out, it could just start again, and it started even more forcefully. And when it finally did die, pretty much the entire city was destroyed or damaged. And this sucks. We have such... like We think we have an image of Rome in our head, and of course we have an image of Rome in our head, but so much of this original Rome has been lost to this fire. Just When was the... The Colosseum was after the fire, wasn't it? Well, as I recall, they broke yeah. ground on it shortly after Vespasian broke ground on it after he ended up coming out on top after the year plus of the of the four emperors. Yes. Literally, it was a. There was also another smaller fire after this. I think was mm. around eighty AD. I believe. <laughs> the point is that they were literally rebuilding Rome for decades under several emperors. It kind of, and I, I know this is more talking about the history, but kind of, it's a little bit like sort of modern scenario everything just, just comes to a halt as we've seen at the moment we're recording this in the midst of a pandemic i'm not saying the entire world's going to be destroyed but that kind of just sort of brings like this one incident just brings everything to a screaming halt and we're fixing it like years and years after just kind of a bit of a bit of a parallel there in screenwriting terms it is referred to as the inciting incident exactly the exciting incident inciting it was kind of exciting as well. <laughs> uh, I, I guess from a distance, I'm sure it probably was. Yes. And so after the fire did finally die and the city was pretty much destroyed, of course, so many people just lost their homes, lost their businesses, lost their livelihoods. And survivors of the fire just sort of made shelter wherever they could. Not only were public uh, spaces camped out into, but public buildings could have been lived in. And we've talked about this, like, this is totally off target. The Colosseum became housing, but that was way later, not related to this. Just wanted to mention that. Yeah, what, was it, wasn't that for uh, clergy? That was for clergy, yeah. But just, it just yeah. sprung to mind then, just just the image of these grand buildings, like, like the Colosseum a bit later on, obviously, just having refugees in them, basically, refugees of this fire. Yeah, absolutely. And and at the end of the day, one of the more, more longing uh, rather, one of the more long-term consequences behind mm. this, and I believe this is due to Tacitus in the Annals, mm. is he begins describing Nero very proactively trying to put the blame for the fire on Christians that were living in Rome at the time. And this had, I mean, that's also one of the other few things that most people, insofar as I know about this at all, they seem to have retained that kernel. Well, there's a reason. I mean, when you said when you said that to me, blaming blaming members of a religion for a fire or blaming a group of people for a fire 
<laughs> what comes to mind for you when you hear that, Paul? Well, I mean, there's a good number of things that I could think of in terms of inciting incidents, but you seem to have something very particular in mind. Does that remind you of the Reichstag at all? That's an interesting way of putting it. Yeah, I mean, you, you could certainly, <laughs> I mean, yes, absolutely, you can, yeah. because he was blaming it on, uh, on socialists or communists, which allowed mm. them to basically shut everything down, outlaw communism and socialism, and it, there's a pretty good chance, uh, I would say a better than pretty good chance, that obviously that was a false flag operation that was yeah. done very yeah. intentionally for exactly the outcome they wanted and created. Mm. But you could have also been referring to Mrs. O'Leary's cow in Chicago, but that, that, that's not nearly so um, uh, Machiavellian. Did someone set a cow on fire? So Mrs. O'Leary's <laughs> cow, that she, I think she was located in southwest Chicago, and hmm. she had a barn, and the, and the idea was that the cow accidentally tipped over a lantern, and that, that is what started the Great Conflagration. Oh, okay. But, oh, that, okay. but that's that. That's more urban legend. I don't believe that has ever been proven to any respect that is beyond reasonable doubt by any means. No, anyway. <laughs> no, no cows involved here so far we know of. But supplies, probably like cows, or beef at least anyway, were bought in from across the empire to help Rome, and food prices were severely reduced just to help these struggling people after this. And the interesting thing about this is while Nero supposedly blamed Christians for starting the fire, people were actually blaming Nero for the fire, because this is where we go into conspiracy theory mode. Put your tin hats on, people. Emperor Nero, at the time when the Great Fire of Rome happened, was away from Rome in a private home, supposedly even performing and singing to some like house guests, I presume, all while the capital of his empire was burning. Yeah, there's that, that, there's that classic depiction of him playing mm. a liar as Rome burns. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, just, it, it's such a wonderful image. And from this rumor such that Nero started this fire, he instructed, not actually started the fire, he was instructed others to start the fire. Hence why we heard of those other men saying they were following orders. And the reason he did this was so Rome could burn down. It could be completely built in his own image. And historians at the time were split whether this was the case or not. And But I, however, I did read that modern historians really do uh, doubt that this was the case and this is more a romantic telling but nevertheless say what you want about nero but like he did use this fire to build his now infamous golden palace which doesn't put him in the best light well that's one of the reasons if you try to reverse engineer it you may think oh well clearly he was doing this purely for the purpose of clearing out land and did he clear out land yeah, that ended up <laughs> yeah. happening, but it's hard to sometimes know whether it's intentional or, or intentional or not. But I can say this, even even an emperor that is truly off their hinges, it's a big leap to to really unleash this onto your own people because you have to be out of your mind to think that you have any ability to control it once it starts. In addition to the fact that it can very clearly undermine your own power, it's probably just easier to kick those people out, bulldoze it, and create whatever it is that you were going to create. But wouldn't an emperor as mad as Nero feel like he could control fire? <laughs> well, that, that, that I can't confirm nor deny. I mean, we, we've certainly seen some pretty batshit crazy people so far yeah. that are calling the shots. <laughs> and the good ones are vastly outnumbered by the ones that you wouldn't follow down the street. But... It's so long ago, and the fact of the matter is, Rome was already so predisposed to this sort of thing anyway. But the fact of the matter is, it's not even so much important as it is how he handled the situation afterwards, especially the persecution of the Christians part, because that really lasted on for a really long time. And Tacitus, because like I said, we were talking about this when we were talking about um, the historical Jesus episode. Tacitus doesn't have by any means what we would call uh, sympathy. For Christianity, you know, he basically calls it more or less a goofy superstition from his perspective. But he remembers very clearly Nero literally going out to the people and and standing atop a circus car in a charioteer's outfit, basically trying to direct the fury of the crowd on on Christians who early on are are not the most well received. I mean, their treatment fluctuates depending on who's in power and if they even care. But that certainly seems to what we were doing here. It's certainly from Tacitus's perspective. But 
it was one natural disaster among many, and it, it's so hard to tell. But the fact of the matter is, was Nero particularly well-suited to power? No. Were a lot of people <laughs> in his position in the first century particularly well-suited to power? No. Nope. <laughs> and it takes a long time before you get some guys that are really good, and then you get some guys that are very capable, but also just absolutely some of the worst human beings that have ever lived. I mean, God, can you imagine living through Domitian? That really sounds awful. Yeah, that does. Yeah, from when we did talk about Domitian, that did not sound like an enjoyable time period for sure. No. And just something I found interesting, I was talking about like people wanted to blame someone for this fire. A lot of people wanted to blame Nero. Nero wanted to blame the Christians. And I think that just goes to Rome. We talked about with the comet. Rome was so superstitious and into omens and signs. And it's just such a Roman thing to, to not just accept that this fire was just an accidental thing that happened, to try and find an answer, to try and find a sign as to why this happened. That's just a very Roman thing. I find that really reflected in this. Oh, absolutely. And then it's also kind mm. of ama amazing how in some ways politics change so little because somebody has to be to blame. And mm. the princep slash emperor at the time certainly didn't want to be that fellow, to be sure. Because this is the thing to remember, everybody, is that when you're concentrating all of this power into a central person, to whatever extent they choose to exercise that, whether it be as a flat-out despotism or as the facade of republicanism, the reality is if you're concentrating all that into one person who realistically can do what they want and people in administration have to cooperate, when something goes wrong, realistically, there is exactly one person to blame because the buck has to stop there realistically. And uh, nobody likes the buck to stop where they are. No, no. And just the one last thing I want to say about the Great Fire of Rome. Um, if, if you want more to say, Paul, please feel free to. But the last thing I just want to add, add about this scenario is just it. This is probably when Rome was almost more or less at its strongest. Would you say, like, it, it definitely is at. It's definitely reaching its imperial height. It mm. is. It is the superpower of Europe, to be sure. None of these other clans or empires could overtake Rome. Something as simple and as natural as just fire would more or less bring its capital to its knees. I just find that fascinating. Like, no, no amount of manpower, like when manpower can't take over a, 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 an empire, just, just, just a bit of fire will do the trick. Oh, yes, absolutely. And even after 2,000 years and everything that we've accomplished technologically, we've been to the moon, we have sent objects beyond our furthest planets and dwarf planets, and we are still in every way vulnerable to exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, like this fire is raging over there. A few years back, there was that awful fire in London Grenf in a, the Grenfell Tower block. Oh, um, I, that was a nightmare. I, I, I could still see yeah. that when I closed my eyes. God, it, that's awful. It, it, yeah. It, and even like oh, not so much fire, but obviously in Lebanon recently, God bless those people. Like, oh, goodness. Bless them. It's just... But this is kind of a bad, uh, a bit of a morbid segue, I suppose. But yeah, the so destruction doesn't history. end there, Paul. Yeah, the destruction doesn't end there, Paul, does it? It never does. But before we hand it off to Anna Domini, be sure to, if you want to help out the show, leave a glowing five star rating and review on Apple Podcast or wherever you enjoy your podcast most. And if you are listening on YouTube, be sure to like share, subscribe, and comment. We want to hear from you. But now, here is Anna Domini. This is the AD History Podcast. Keep up with the show and join the discussion by following AD History on Twitter with the handle at AD History PC and the hashtag AD History. Check us out over on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube by searching AD History Podcast. As well as, of course, tgnreview.com slash AD History Podcast. Now, back to Paul and Patrick. And a bang-up job as always, AD. So we're back, Patrick. And mm -hmm. the next item we are going to hit, of course, is the super famous, though we did not cover it, eruption at Mount Vesuvius and the most notable destruction of Pompeii. 
Yeah, like this is this is one of the most famous. I'd, I'd say this is one of the most famous events in like ancient history. I think if you ask most people to name something about Rome or like the Roman Empire, I think Pompeii and its destruction would be on there. I can't be like seventeen ninety. I think instead I talked about the destruct the construction of the Colosseum instead. But I was darn close to talking about Pompeii. But we can talk about it here instead. Oh yes, and there's a, there's so much to talk about here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So feel free to kick it off. So yeah, I would have yeah. So this the, the events of the destruction of Pompeii started in 79 AD, and in this time period, Pompeii was a really well-to-do town for the Roman elite. A lot of people had like their second holiday homes in Pompeii. It was really that kind of place. Wealthy citizens, a wealthy, well-to-do place. And while people had holiday homes there, it, it, it was a permanent residence. There were about 12,000 people living in the city town at that time. However, for as good as it was, the town was just about five miles away from Mount Vesuvius. And if there's anything you don't want to be five miles close to, a volcano is on that list. And, and this volcano had erupted many times in the past. And those who, and those who lived by it we're fine with this. They kind of just accepted this is where we live. Like, Paul, could you imagine living by a volcano? I would rather not. No. But, <laughs> but, yeah. I mean, I'm sure people, No. People in Italy still do to this day, I suppose. And the first warnings about what was going to happen at Pompeii and it was in 62 AD. And of course, well, 62 AD is a very long time from 79 AD, you know, well over 10 years. In like geological terms, that's no time at all. If you ever talk to a geologist about like time periods and how long things take to happen, like a million years is a second or so. So from 62 AD to 79 AD, that was that was the blink of an eye in volcano terms. And there was an earthquake in 62 AD, and many modern scientists believe that was a forewarning of things to come. And it was 16 years after this quake. It was either in August or October. We're not too sure when the eruption happened, but Vesuvius erupted once more and ash, rock, and boiling volcanic ashes and gases were just launched into the sky. And this could be seen from hundreds of miles away. This was an eruption probably unlike anything we've seen, at least at least in the next thousand years, I suppose. Or maybe, maybe more. My, my volcano history isn't too caught out of that it would have been a mighty mighty eruption and of course all this stuff all this rock and ash and gases that came up from Vesuvius well what comes up must come down and it slowly and surely start to descend onto the town literal hellfire raining from the sky and of course many fled from the town but not all some weren't quick enough to get out or some felt they didn't feel compelled enough to come out. And Pompeii was first covered in millions of tons of ash. And after this, rocks and the volcanic gases took over the city and it just kept on hailing down. We've all seen the episode of Doctor Who with Pompeii, right? You know, imagine that. Fair enough. <laughs> just the way the ash acted as a, as a preservation mm. agent, though is really, despite the absolute tragedy that occurred there, and there's no question that it was, it has mm. been from an archaeological perspective and a historian's perspective, a gift that came at extremely high human cost. Oh, God, yeah. it was an absolute snapshot of life in Pompeii at the time of the eruption. And... There are so few times when you go this far back that you're given this much palpable insight into an ancient world that hasn't existed for over a millennia and a half, which is really incredible. It, it's absolutely incredible. And in the same way, the Great Fire of Rome, we lost so much archaeological evidence that would be amazing to have today. It kind of makes up for it with what was uh, maintained in Pompeii. It was incredible. Yeah, like you said, Paul, that ash just preserved. And like even the bodies, you know, we've all seen those famous pictures from Pompeii of like people standing or huddling as ashy remains. It's haunting, but it, in a morbid way and in an archaeological way, it is valuable to have that. And when this eruption 
eventually did end all those years and years ago. Many people actually went back to the city to try and find loved ones or possessions. Of course, they didn't have the ability to scrape up those millions of tons of ash. You know, that only happened way later. The, the site was actually only found again in 1748. That's how long Pompeii remained uncovered for. Well over. You know, that's pretty much 1,700 years. It just lay dormant under all the ash. It's incredible. It is. It's absolutely incredible. The thing that I find so funny about it is mm. in the time period it was initially largely rediscovered and then slowly began being excavated over the following century is that they were finding images and evidence of life where it very clearly grabbed them by the collar because social mores and taboos had changed so much between mm. when the eruption occurred and when those who were excavating it so long after were finding it to the point where things that Romans of the time would have considered as natural, commonplace, something you wouldn't even give a second thought to, it, those much later on found themselves kind of covering their eyes because all <laughs> of their sensibilities socially had changed in certain respects a great deal. And if these are things that you know one is particularly sensitive about, uh, Pompeii would not have really been the place you wanted to go. No, and, and that, that does just sort of come onto that wider subject of and this is kind of unrelated to Pompeii, but as you're saying, the social taboos over the years have changed so much. It's fascinating. Like, you would think the further back in time, the more prudish, for lack of a better term, people were. But the Romans and like especially the Greeks, they weren't prude at all. That happened way later. Like, people were like doing all sorts of stuff, and then they got much more reserved. It's just, it's fascinating. I always find that interesting in history. Oh, oh, absolutely. And and it's it's a very it's an extremely demonstrative example of when you and I talk about history in the past being its own mm. country, is it not? Where no, it's a perfect example. And so where you're where you're coming from a certain perspective, because in the end, you and I were talking about this the other day, how whether we like it or not, we're all a product of our own time and thinking in mm. ways we're not even necessarily conscious of, to be sure. And then one is faced with something like this that is just so antithetical to mm. a variety of values and what is considered inbounds and out of bounds. It serves as a, a remarkable sticking point to that idea that in some ways you're always kind of overcoming your own inherent worldview. You can be standing in the same place. You can even be directly descended genetically from these folks, but the way things change culturally and our values, they can very easily clash. And as historians of, of any degree, whatever that might be, whatever their specialization is, we're always looking to overcome that to best understand their world on their terms. Yes, I couldn't put it about myself. Like some of the things we hear about what not not just Romans, but as we carry on through AD, some of the things that were social norms will sort of shock us and make us double take. But you just got to remember that was how things were, were that time. I, I'm not saying it forgives it. And it, we, you know, we, I'm definitely not saying, oh, well, they did it then. It's fine to do it now because that isn't the case. But we just need to realize that was the norm at that time. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's the different. There's a difference between explaining something and comprehend, uh, uh, comprehending something, even understanding something and absolving something. So hmm. an explanation of what's happening is not the same as giving it absolution. They're two very hmm. different things, and our job is the first, and the, it's definitely yeah. not the latter. However one chooses to, to handle that information, of course, is theirs to be sure, but for the most part and for all intents and purposes, there is that big difference between comprehension and explanation and giving something absolution. Yes, perfectly, uh, perfectly put, Paul. Couldn't have put it better myself. However, Pompeii, as we were saying, while some of these people in the 1700s may have not liked what they were seeing around the people of Pompeii, they adored what the actual city of Pompeii looked like. Yeah, I, I completely understand where you're coming from on this. Imagine to have actually been there while this was happening. 
the sheer terror of what occurred. I mean, you were asking me earlier, can you imagine what it was like living next to a volcano? And short answer is no, and certainly I don't want to. But even for me in, in, the, in the American Northeast, as far as I'm concerned, I am far too close to the super volcano that sits in Yellowstone National Park. Of course, you know, of course. That's the one that can end us all, Patrick. Cross yeah. your fingers, say your Hail Marys, because that's all we're going to have should that occur. Well, here's a question for you, Paul. Um, oh. Sometimes you ask, you're northeast based. A few years, well, about 10 years ago now or so, that volcano went off in Iceland. Yeah. Did that affect, did that affect you in the northeast at all? Because I know it affected Europe. Did it blow your way? Well, the jet stream is going away from us mm -hmm. at that point. So naturally, I think you guys would have been the more enjoy the natural consequences of that action. No, I mean, mm. the, the one thing in the U.S. as far as volcanoes go, where it was truly felt across the continent, and it was a little before I was born, was the eruption of Mount St. Helens in Washington State. I remember a teacher of mine a long time back saying he was even down in Texas and he saw some of the fallout from that amazing eruption. So I have not personally experienced anything like that. Certainly, I don't believe having to do with Iceland. I certainly don't recall it. As far as the U.S. is concerned, Mount St. Helens being what it was, apparently, I wasn't around to know, but so <laughs> I have been told. Yeah, it, it, it just it kind of does relate back to the fire. Like these natural, these natural disasters, they can like. It doesn't, they don't care how, you don't care if you've got the biggest empire in the Mediterranean, a volcano will still beat you. And it's just fascinating to see like this volcano affecting these great, powerful people that are just something as naturally, man, as naturally made as a volcano, just ruining their day, basically. That definitely translates into a bad hair day, to say the least. <laughs> yeah. But as I was sort of hinting towards, um, the people of the 1700s, 18th century, they adored what Pompeii looked like. When they rediscovered it, sure, they might have not have enjoyed the morals and sensibilities of the Romans, but goodness, they loved they loved the architecture of Rome. And this the, the Pompeii, the, this the rediscovery of Pompeii actually helped create a neoclassical revival in architecture in the 18th century, as many liked the look of Pompeii so much. So they, they started building, hey, this stuff looks great. And this this is probably the first time these people were seeing such it's seeing actual roman architecture not in pictures or like paintings actually seeing it for their own eyes they thought damn that's some pretty stuff like we should we should do some more of it ourselves and that classic roman style has maintained throughout the years and i'm sure pompeii the rediscovery of pompeii helped with that and of course while it's awful so many people have to die about 2000 if i said it's 2000 people died from the eruption of vesuvius in pompeii on that single day alone but without that, we might not. It gives us a much clearer idea of what life was like, not only in Rome, what well, wasn't in Rome, but in the wider Roman Empire. It gives us a look at just the everyday lives of what these people were doing. It certainly does, and I had no idea that it was so influential in trying to bring in a revival of neoclassical architecture. No, me neither. But when I read that, I was like, "Wow, that's amazing!" But it kind of makes sense. You do see Roman design still standing to this day, and. I believe Washington was, and you, may, you might know more about this, but Washington DC was heavily inspired by Roman architecture. And you can see that the moment you say that, you think like the Lincoln Memorial, think about those columns. It does make a lot of sense. The White House, the US yeah. Capitol, uh, Jefferson Memorial, obviously Lincoln. I mean, it really does go on and on. And it's one of the reasons it's, it's so iconic. And the, clearly they were very taken with the idea of making these buildings in a neoclassical fashion. So it, it's definitely something to consider to a, a great degree because it's iconic for a reason. It very much grabs the imagination, especially just the way they're constructed. You can very much see both the, the sum of, appreciate the, the individual parts that create the sum of the whole and also appreciating the whole in general and just the incredible elements and and the amazing knowledge and experience that was generated and furthered all these years back in something as as fundamental as architecture and engineering to the point where it's still influencing us influencing us today when we think of neoclassical architecture in so many ways it is 
connected and related to the idea of grand, far-reaching power. It has a certain mm. dignity to it in a way that is not comparable in many other ways. There are certainly others that are its equals, but especially in the West, neoclassical architecture, if you see that, whether it be the White House or the Parthenon or the Rotunda mm. at the University of Virginia, it sends those direct connections and emotions to feel like, oh, I am standing in front of something that's really important. I'm just looking at the Rotunda now in West Virginia, Paul. It's not West and Virginia. Looks... It's, it, it is Virginia. Oh, just and, Virginia, and, my bad. Yeah, Charlottesville. My, bro my brother is a an alumni of UVA, so I have to be very careful to make that distinction. Those could turn into fighting words. And Paul, I'm just looking at the rotunda in the University of Virginia, and I've, I've never actually seen this building before. And t talking about things being inspired by Rose Pass, if you look at the Pantheon in Rome, if you have, the, if you, I'm sure you have a computer on you right now, if you Google the Pantheon in Rome, they're identical. There's like a cylinder building with a, like a square with pillars on the front. It was quite remarkable. It just how long those that architectural design has maintained for and pompeii it probably wouldn't be a thing without the discovery of pompeii where they could have seen not neoclassical architecture but actual classical architecture of their own eyes this is very true and in fact even the rotunda of uva has inspired uh, very similar ones for example down at smu which is southern methodist university in dallas texas they created their own rotunda based on the <laughs> University of Virginia, which was, of course, based on the Pantheon in Rome. It just keeps reaching. It just keeps reaching. Yeah. Just, just that, that timelessness of that architectural design. And oh, we should start an architecture podcast next time. <laughs> oh, goodness, yes. I mean, God, we're looking at this and we have the opportunity to sit back. You and I have just completed, obviously, our pilot season. We've covered mm. a century. And in the grand scheme of the universe, a century is not even a drop in the bucket. In the, no. grand, in the grand history of humanity with, the, the, you know, with Homo sapiens prevailing, it's still barely a drop in the bucket. And, you know, we have to think back on this, Patrick, here. And I'm going to answer mm. my own question because it's something I've been thinking about and we've kind of alluded to a bit, which is, when we look back at this century, what have we learned that we didn't have the strongest feeling for or insight into when we started? And for me, the first place that one needs to go when answering that question is realizing exactly how interconnected this ancient world was between Europe, Eurasia, Africa, and the vast lands of Asia. And that these people were all very much familiar with each other. So if you take something like the Romans and the Han Chinese, yes, they most certainly did know about each other. And they most certainly did send envoys to each other. It took a long time to get there. But apparently Chinese administrators thought of the Roman Empire, Han Chinese administrators thought of the Roman Empire as an equivalent power to their own. In fact, they would even colloquially call it the treasure country because of all the incredible things that would come from there. And for them, uh, especially glass, glassware, which they would get from Alexandria in Egypt, which of course was by this time, for the most part, an imperial Roman province. What's interesting though, is that the Romans did not have the same high opinion of the Han Chinese, which kind of <laughs> gives you a little bit of insight as, as to exactly the angle at which their nose was to most other non-Romans but they did know about each other and that there's so much connection. And, and that Silk Road, even though there were no cars or, or trucks, the Silk Road was still a, an ancient super highway mm. that, the, that the Cushion Empire clearly <laughs> made yes. more than a few sparkly coins off of, right? Yes, definitely. No, definitely. That, that is, I'd say, the main takeaway I would have seen from these first, from, from 1 AD to 100 AD, we so easily often think that these were just sort of their own people doing their own things. Rome was here, China was there, and there was nothing in between. But they were so gosh darn connected. And it, it's quite remarkable just even these first hundred years seeing that connection. And it's only going to get more connected as we go on. But yeah, absolutely. And if you're, and if you're a, a major Roman leader in Rome, whether it be the Princeps Emperor or 
somebody particularly influential. It is really one of the great early demonstrations of practicing grand strategy, where you're dealing with an immense landmass with tens of millions of people within it. Wherever something is going on and whatever decision you make can have profound impacts on other parts of its empire that geographically, distance-wise, are far distant from the area that you are focusing on. So if you decide to send another legion of Britain, that means there's another legion that isn't available in eastern Anatolia. <laughs> and on top of that, just having to create complex means uh, of trade economically, connecting this world not just by land but by sea, because that's one of the things about the Romans. Initially, they may not have been so fond of getting their feet wet, but mm. by virtue of being right there in the Mediterranean, that being their world, and they most certainly knew it, as I said in the previous episode, they have to be both subsequently land creatures and sea creatures, whereas when you get later on and you have the British Empire, British are primarily sea creatures. And it's interesting mm. to see how the geography ultimately is shaping how they, not just they see their world, but how they have to adapt to it in order to administrate on this grand level. In addition to some of their more interesting sensibilities of how they ruled, that so long as you weren't giving them a terrible headache and you weren't, for the most part, outright disrespecting their customs or gods, they would be more keen to leave you alone. I always found that so fascinating. That wasn't always true. You know, like I said, you had folks like Domitian that when it came to the Roman religion were could only be described as born again in that respect. But they mm -hmm. were very, very practical if they could be. They know what they wanted. And I thought that was so, so fascinating. And the other thing I wanted to mention is I think one of the most revealing segments in our first season from this first century was mm -hmm. the segment that you did on Strabo's The Geography. And, <laughs> that was and, a very fun time. And what exactly it is able to tell us about how the, the most knowledgeable and uh, in the know Romans would have seen their world, their place in it, and then comparing it to our knowledge today, it is truly a mind-boggling experience. You went into this deeper than I did, so I'm curious what your thoughts are, Patrick. Well, that kind of does lead into something that I took away from looking into these first 100 years, and it does it very relates with Strabo and his geography. These people were clever. It's so easy to think that, like, everyone in the past was stupid, and there were some dumb people in the past. And Oh, God, yes. <laughs> so, some might argue that people might get dumber as time goes on and then get smart again. We did have a dark age after all, but that, that's a conversation for another time. But just these people were clever and they could, they could map out things. Sure, these maps weren't perfect, but they were damn impressive for not being able to get a bird's eye perspective of Earth. And we saw that with Strabo's maps and just the, the letters we had from people to one another. These were clever, clever people. They weren't, they weren't cavemen bashing sticks by any means. And I'm just always taken aback by what people have by them. We talked about some of the invent um, inventions, like the alio pile as well. As you mentioned, that was one of the more interesting things I found. My goodness, is that a find? Yeah, like the, the, these people knew what they were doing, I would say simply put. They knew what they were doing. They were a clever bunch of people. They certainly were. And the other, the other part of this that I thought was so fascinating, and I have to give you credit on this, hmm. is really beginning the spark of exploration for East Asia and, hmm. and the Han Dynasty. And from, our, from a Western perspective for you and I, Patrick, this is not usually something that we're really taught all that much. Uh, I don't know about you, no, but it certainly, cool. it certainly has, was true for me. I, I mean, at one point I did take Japanese history, <laughs> which it was just overwhelming at the, the age I took it simply because it's so, so old. And I look forward to getting into Japan in the future because there's some really cool stuff that's going on yeah. there. But how there, there is this, and what we would largely consider today to be the old world, just how dominant the Han Chinese were. And you begin getting this sense, you know, despite the various ills of who runs China today, how ancient a civilization it is. And this conception that dynasties come and go, and that for the most part, a lot of Chinese today look at the current government as another dynasty, but that 
no one of them is the defining feature that it's this sweep of civilization that just is continuous you know one group comes together holds it all then it comes apart and it shatters and it comes up together again and it goes on and on and there's a, a definitive continuity to it in a way that as an american living in the present well we have our distinct cultural roots from many many places that is mm -hmm. something that in, is truly special it's true of japan it's true of korea it's true of the indian subcontinent eurasia europe and africa but for one of those who have ancestors who emigrated from those places and are part of a very short period of time and people that have now made north america or the Americas, their home, just how small that sweep of history is, both in terms of what's happened since our ancestors got here and what exists today when you compare it to those portions of the old world. Even you, Patrick, you, you have many, many, many cultural influences that go <laughs> a long way back. But having that, that strong connection, especially, say, to the Romans themselves, You've talked about it before. It's something we don't really have here, not in the same way, and certainly not to the same extent. No, definitely not. And couldn't agree with you more there, but it was just incredible saying how mixed America is compared to Roma. Like you yourself, Paul, you have Italian ancestry, so this all to come from there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's no question that there's plenty of Roman heritage going oh, way, 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 way back. Southern Mediterranean is. <laughs> Is my ancestral ancestral swimming pool to be sure the Mediterranean in general? What are your closing thoughts on this century, Patrick? What are some of the more profound thoughts that you have developed in the earliest part of this journey of ours? I think we've kind of laid out a lot of my earlier thoughts. I think things that took me back is this was a much more interconnected world than we ever intended it on being. These were some really smart people. And there was a damn lot going on in this world, even if we don't know all about it because their histories weren't as recorded. But there was things kicking off all over the world. And Paul, this is the last question I want to ask you. Of course. From 1 AD to 100 AD, what do you think changed the most, say, just in Rome or in the world in general? What do you think was the biggest change? Because that's 100 years. Think, think 1900 to 2000. They seem like different time periods. What do you think was the biggest change in this hundred years to the world? You're seeing a lot of the seeds getting planted mm. for the world that we know. From the Western perspective, obviously the, the life and uh, experiences and the continuation of teachings that came from the life of Jesus of Nazareth is going to become, you know, it, it starts as a small wave and then over 2,000 years turns into a tidal wave, you know, roughly mm -hmm. half the, the planet today uh, considers itself in one form or another Christian, whether that be Orthodox, Roman, Catholic, uh, Protestant, let's put them all in the same boat because they're coming from the same <laughs> origin point. And even though the, the Jewish diaspora did start technically a bit earlier because not everybody came back from Babylon after 600 BC, one of the truly major and influential aspects of the diaspora of the Jews living in first century Roman Palestine is you see Jews basically fanning out all over the world. And I find that truly exceptional. And of course, and this is really unfortunate, is that you look at all of the information that had been accumulated and then seeing how much of it ends up getting lost, especially when you talk about something like a series of fires at the Library of Alexandria where we lose a, a ton of information, things that we knew, and you kind of relay this a little bit, touched on it a few minutes ago, how we tend to forget or lose things that we already know. Or another thing, not just to focus in on religion, but it's so influential, of course, is Buddhism arriving in China. My goodness, mm -hmm. Buddhism arriving in China means Buddhism is going to arrive in the Korean Peninsula. It means it's going to arrive in Japan. And it's such an incredibly defining aspect of those cultures for, for peoples that compose such a large population of the earth today. What about yourself, Patrick? I don't think I could add any more than you just add. This definitely was 
a century of planting seeds. So many seeds were planted in this. I mean, this this, this whole anodonomy, it, it all begins with the birth of Jesus. And even in these first hundred years, Christianity has, has come a long, long way. And it's only going to get bigger, like you said. Like oh, yeah. said, Buddhism arriving in China, that's going to become a huge thing. Rome literally does become a huge thing. It gets bigger and bigger during this first century. Things, things just being planted. A lot of seeds are being planted in all this time. And I just think it's fascinating. I'm looking forward to seeing what happens in the next 100 years, from 101 AD to 200 AD, then from 201 to 300 AD. We've still got a long, long way to go, Paul. No, this is in truth our, our one baby step. But the other one I would note that is, especially when you're looking closely at the internal political machinations of the Roman Empire, when they're transitioning kind of slowly from republic to empire that is ruled by a very rigid democracy, but a democracy all the less to secretive one-man rule to one way or another, and seeing how so many of the political lessons and values and tactics and strategy from those times are still in every way possible, entirely recognizable and present in our current modern HD world. It definitely is one of those incredible portions of the brick and mortar that make up our HD world. This is the AD History Podcast. So guys, we next time you hear from us, it will be kicking off season two. And remember, this fall, we're going from one episode to two episodes a month or once every two weeks. We'll get more information out to you as we get closer. But once again, thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to hearing from you again. If you ever want to get in contact with Patrick and myself, you know where to find us on social media, whether it be at AD History PC or on Facebook at facebook.com slash ad history or instagram.com slash ad history podcast or our primary page tgnreview.com slash ad history podcast and if you're looking to get hold of us directly for any reason you can email us at ad history podcast at tgnreview.com but patrick i would say that's all for now thank you guys so much thank you all so much until next time like all good things we come to an end for today Thank you for listening to the AD History Podcast. It is listeners such as yourself who make this show possible and truly awesome. Be sure to follow and subscribe for upcoming AD History Podcast episodes, available wherever podcasts are found. Also, follow AD History on social media. Follow the show on Twitter at the handle at ADHistoryPC as well as on Facebook by visiting facebook.com slash adhistorypodcast and Instagram as adhistorypodcast. In addition to liking and subscribing on YouTube by searching adhistorypodcast. Do you have a direct comment or question for Paul and Patrick? Drop them an email at adhistorypodcast at tgnreview.com. Also, be sure to visit the show's homepage, at tgnreview.com slash adhistorypodcast. For Paul and Patrick, thank you for listening to the AD History. We'll see you again next time in the ever-growing tapestry of world history.